When we look at the patterns of history, we see a lot of common denominators. And one of the common denominators is that we have a shadow government. Um, the CIA was created by the secret societies, by the Skull and Bones. It is a Bavarian secret society. And this is a very deep rabbit hole. Can't go over this in a short period of time. And, and the only way I can explain it is it is an infiltration of everything that is good in the world, an infiltration of all the institutions from the religious to the political to the civic to the businesses everything corporate positions the CIA was designed for this to help further the new world order the regime changes everything else that everything that has happened since its creation and where it was created and uh, I have plenty of videos I just put up here on Truth Talk News Channel 2 uh, going into the CIA so please take take the time to check out the channel. It's a new channel. There's not many views there because it's brand new. I was getting almost 200,000 views per month on the channel they shut down because this information people aren't talking about it. Why don't they talk about it? Why is it silenced? Why do they attack me and they let people put full length movies up on on uh, YouTube and they don't take those movies down? And that's that they're claiming it's fair use too, right? So so what's going on here really? Why is the table tilted? Why is why do they speak about equality and create uh, inequality? Hmm? Why do they speak about these things and do the opposite? Because that's how the new world order rolls. And Mike Rupert, who passed away last year, uh, sadly, uh, has a great presentation that I'm going to show you right now. And it goes into these details. It goes into the into the way that the infiltration works. Like you see Giuseppe Mazzini and Albert Pike. Albert Pike was the head of Freemasonry in the southern jurisdiction of the United States. And Giuseppe Mazzini was the founder of the Mafia, the black hand that came into New York, okay? And that's why we have this, con this connection when we were going to go into Italy, why we used, uh, we, we used the Mafia. We knew who they were, right? Sure, well, it's more than just we knew who they were. And we offered them a deal, okay? They're all working together. We're all working together. The Mafia is working for the New World Order. They are. They feel it's their own personal business and everything they're doing. And But when they're tasked to do something, they do it, and they don't see what the ramifications might be or there might be an alternative agenda. The connection goes back, for example, between the Mafia and the P2 Lodge in 1980 uh, with the murder of Roberto Calvi and the whole Vatican banking scandal because the Vatican is in on it. I mean, it's everything. But, but what I want to focus on right now is the drugs, because we see this, again, this rise of heroin deaths, and where is this heroin coming from? It's coming from Afghanistan, where we recently went to war, okay? And how this has happened in Vietnam, and it's happened in, uh, in every conflict since, the Iran-Contra scandal. And this 1996 uh, lecture that Rupert gives goes into it. Now, he, he was an LAPD officer, but he was a CIA agent. He was, he was, he discusses how the CIA infiltrate things. I mean, your next door neighbor who says that he works for Northward Grumman and goes to work every day could be a CIA agent. They do this and it's there. You never know who they are. They can just be put on to you, you know? So there are many levels of it and he goes into a lot of it and Please, stay tuned for this entire presentation. Think about it. Do the critical thinking and do what I said at the very beginning. Don't believe any of it until you can substantiate it. But I am telling you that I'm giving you the information. So you've got a path of breadcrumbs to the truth. And everything that's put up here, I swear on a stack of Bibles, I'll, make a, I'll swear and attest to God now that I have, where's the hand there, I have verified I swear under oath that I have verified all the information that I've ever put up on any of these channels. And all of it, I have found to be true. I put no disinformation. Everything that I have researched is true. I swear to God. Watch this. Share Truth Talk News Channel 2 and check out Truth Talk News. Don't forget HowardNema.com. There's a plethora of information there as well with links to books and all sorts of important information that's suppressed and not discussed to understand why the world is the way it is today, the direction it's going, why, and who's behind it.
Here is a very big piece of the puzzle. Good evening. Welcome to the Granada Forum, an organization dedicated to the truth. At the end of the program, our speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer program without restriction. Feel free to ask any question. That's the true meaning of free, freedom of speech. Even the press is invited to ask questions if any of them are here. As children, we are taught of a word called character. As adults, we seldom run into those with it. <laughs> Least wise in the media or inside the beltway. It takes character to stand alone and, like David, challenge Goliath. Like Terry Reed of Compromise, like Gary Aldrich of Unlimited Access, like Chris Reddy of Death of Ed Foster, like Ambrose Pritchard of the London Daily Telegraph. We have men of character in our own midst. They seldom are forced into the limelight until the conduct of others that betray their public trust force the issue. The fabric of our society has been torn by some that have an agenda and have suppressed it. On November 15th of 1996, just three months ago, a dedicated true patriot stood his ground and did what we call, what we call, uh, what we can appreciate. Picture in your minds, I, CIA Director John Deutsch, on a propaganda mission to South Central Los Angeles to calm the waters as a result of articles that appeared in the San Jose Mercury News. He, he was hosted by uh, Congresswoman Juanita McDonalds. Without blinking an eye, our speaker said, I am a former Los Angeles police narcotics detective, and I can tell you that you that you tell you that the agency has been dealing in drugs in this country for a long time. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to in, uh, greet in the behalf of the Granada Forum and introduce a man that deserves our respect and attention. Please welcome Mr. Michael Ruppert. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess the first thank you I'd like to give tonight is to uh, someone who's not here, Mr. Peter Ford of KIV Radio, who, who introduced me to you all and uh, who made it possible for me to be here tonight. I did a show last night from uh, midnight to 2, and it was a wonderful experience. And uh, if what we do tonight is anything like that, I think we're all going to have a lot of fun. I'd also like to thank Ann, who was very kind uh, to make arrangements for me tonight. Um, in 19 years, this is the first chance, believe it or not, that I have had to address an assembled group of people on one issue and to teach what I know and to share my experiences. I've done it in snippets, I've done it on radio talk shows, but never with uh, the opportunity to lay out some evidence and make a case, and I'm very grateful for that. It was a long wait. And uh, um, I am here tonight in two capacities. Uh, if there's any lawyers in the room, I'll pray for you, but um, <laughs> you know that um, in a court of law, they talk about evidence. And one of the first kinds, and actually the most preferred kind of direct evidence, is witness testimony. And all over the major media and in Congress, you hear statements that there is no evidence that CIA deals drugs. Well, a witness can raise his hand under oath in court, and that becomes evidence when he tells his story. And I have evidence to give you from my own experience. I am also here as a detective, if you will, although I have not carried a badge for uh, since November 30th, 1978. I consider myself to have been a detective working on one case for all these years. And so I'm going to present to you some of that evidence tonight. I want to start by giving you a, just a little historical background, and you'll see all these books on the table here, and I don't know if they're in frame or not, they're probably not. But you'll see The Big White Lie by Michael Levine, who is a former DEA station chief, or country attache, they call it, from Argentina. He was present in Argentina in 1980 when the Central Intelligence Agency installed the government of Luis Garcia Meza, who was a cocaine lord, and gave him the whole country. And that was done in conjunction with the Argentine military. Garcia Meza's chief of security was Klaus Barbie the butcher of Lyon, okay? Uh, so there was heavy Nazi infiltration into the Argentinian military. Mike Levine was there. He documented it. He protested it. And, of course, it fell into this black hole that those of us in law enforcement know so well. The next book 
is that you see there is written by the only man uh, that I'm aware of who has been at this longer than I have. And I'm going to hold this one up. It's called The Politics of Heroin. It was originally called The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia by Professor Alfred McCoy, published first in 1972. That's 25 years ago. Okay? It is a Bible for those of us who do this. When we talk about names, dates, places, the names, the dates, and the places are in here. Now, again, if there's any lawyers in here, lawyers love to sue people. Okay? Why is it that this book has never been sued? There's a saying in the law, the truth is an absolute defense against libel. Okay? This is, this is one of our major Bibles. It's in here. It was recently revised and updated to include all kinds of information on Iran-Contra. Okay. The next book that I want to show you, actually there are two, both written by the same authors. And these two men, I know both of them. Um, they're both uh, brilliant men. Uh, professor Peter Dale Scott is a professor of English, believe it or not, at UC Berkeley. Uh, he got into this many years ago, and he has a Ph.D., and he is a dedicated researcher. His co-writer, Jonathan Marshall, is a, a, about as rare as a good lawyer. He's a good reporter. Uh, he uh, works for the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, he's an award-winning journalist. Neither one of these two books, which names names, name names, dates, places, times, quantities, relationships, documents, have ever been sued. Ever. Okay, so when... Jack Blum, who was the chief counsel for this Kerry committee uh, during the Iran-Contra era, uh, recently testified to your friend and mine, Arlen Specter. He said, we don't need to go out and investigate. We know. What he was alluding to is what is contained specifically in this book, which is all about Iran-Contra. Names, dates, places, computer logs, everything, it's all in here. Okay, we already know. We don't have to investigate. We know the CIA deals drugs. Of course, the Los Angeles Times completely omitted any reference to Jack Blum's testimony in their stories. Okay, uh, these two books will give you anything you need to refute. You could take Oliver North apart with about ten pages from this the, this book alone and bury him. Okay. The last book that I wanted to show you. It's almost impossible to get in this country. I wonder why. You can get it in Canada. Written by my dear friend, Celerino Castillo. Celi was uh, a DEA agent. He's a decorated Vietnam vet who served uh, first in Peru. And then in the Iran-Contra era, he served in Central America. He served in Honduras and Salvador and uh, Guatemala. And he was at Ilopango Airport, which was the major Contra supply airport in El Salvador for the northern front of the Contra war effort. And he describes in this, uh, at the airport, two hangars, hangars four and hangars five. Now, he's got the records. Uh, uh, hangar four was the CIA hangar. Hangar five was the NSC hangar, both controlled by Oliver North. He recorded tail numbers. He watched the cocaine being loaded. He talked to the pilots. He got the flight plans. He watched as the planes were given gratis entry across the border into the United States. He wrote reports. And what happened was Ambassador Edwin Corr, who is now teaching at the University of Oklahoma at Norman, came to Selly and said, leave it alone, bud. It's a White House operation. That's evidence. That's a clue. Um, uh, Selly had this wonderful experience of uh, going to a formal dinner at the U.S. Embassy in El Salvador. And the guest of honor that night was Vice President George Herbert Walker Bush. And, and so Selly was there and Bush was there. And they bring Bush over to Selly and Mr. Vice President, this is Celerino Castillo, our senior DEA agent. And how do you do? You're, Mr. Bush, you're a hero for the country. And Selly said, Mr. Vice President, I got to talk to you. There's something really wrong going on here. And they're flying drugs out of four and five, and the CIA's behind it. And George Bush said, nice to meet you, and walked away. You know. <clears throat> Don't let anybody ever tell you there is no evidence. There is a mountain of evidence already in existence. Okay, it is irrefutable. It is ironclad. All right. Now, given that, I want to paint a little picture for you. I want to go back historically, because my own experience is going to add a little dimension to this for you. 
picture that I have a blackboard behind me, which I don't, okay? But say there's a blackboard, and we're going to say that right here is Southeast Asia. And then right here is the United States, and right here is South America, and over here is the Middle East, okay? Somebody was talking earlier about organized crime and CIA. And, of course, my opinion is CIA is organized crime. Um, in the Second World War, uh, some deals were made between the Office of Strategic Services and the Mafia in New Orleans. We were afraid of Nazi sabotage, so we took a guy named Lucky Luciano out of prison in New York. And we... Uh, and, and he guaranteed that there would be no sabotage on the, on the docks in New York. We took a guy named Vito Genovese. I like that. Vito Genovese. And we let him go back to Sicily to spy on it so that we could invade Sicily when Patton go in there, when, went in there. Of course, they went right back into the drug business. They went right back into their operations. The bond is very, very close. Stop there. Fast forward to 1954. 1954, Dien Bien Phu. The French were kicked out of Indochina. Now, almost everybody knows that the Golden Triangle in Indochina is where most of the world's heroin has come from for a long time. It is the largest opium-growing region in the world. There are several others. The French, in order to sustain their war, had been paying the local tribesmen, the Hmong tribesmen, uh, and Kuomintang, the Chinese who were kicked out of China, with opium, which, is a, which was a long hold over from the British opium trade from the 18th century. Um, when the French went out, we filled that void, and we sent some people to Indochina. Their names were Adderholt, Singlaub. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Um, there was also a guy by the name of Paul Hellowell, and there was a guy by the name of Richard Stilwell. And these are the people that we sent into Southeast Asia, CIA, to take over where the French left. Extremely well documented. And one of the first things John Singlaub did, and one of the first things Paul Hellowell did, was to take over the payment of Kuomintang and other rebels with heroin. It was just the way you did business. As we moved closer to the Vietnam era, that trade began to expand because of the relationship between CIA and the Mafia. As we get to the Vietnam War, now again, picture I'm drawing on the board up here some other names. So if, if, if we fast forward to the Vietnam era, I'm going to write some other names in Southeast Asia. Theodore Shackley, station chief in Laos, later station chief in Saigon. Richard Secord. Anybody ever hear that name? Nah. Richard Armitage. Anybody ever hear that name? Eric von Marbad. Anybody ever hear that name? Okay. Von, von Marbod was in the military at the time, uh, Department of Defense. They all worked extremely closely together. Tom Kleins is another one who was Ted Shackley's deputy in Laos. Extremely well documented. There are still living witnesses. There are Air America pilots still alive uh, who later became involved in Iran-Contra. That we ran the whole war in Laos, which was completely without, outside of congressional uh, ex, uh, oversight, with heroin. We've all heard the stories about heroin coming back in body cavities in the dead GIs. Air America, Air Heroin, okay, the Black Plains. Uh, in in uh, the last 19 years, I have spoken to more than a dozen members, former members of the U.S. Army Special Forces, the Green Berets, who were sometimes ordered to carry the heroin by CIA. We ran this whole war there on heroin money. That heroin money did not just pay for the war, it paid for a lot of other things. Now, what happened is, and the picture that I want to paint to you, is, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with the disease of alcoholism, okay? I happen to be an alcoholic. I'm sober 14 years, okay? So I know a little bit about it. And uh, what happens is, is that it's a progressive disease. One is too many, and 10,000 is not enough. Once you take a little, you have to take more. And there's no way to stop until you crash and burn, until you eventually burn yourself out. What happened in Vietnam was that by 1970, the heroin trade had spilled over and we were selling it to our own GIs. One third of the GIs in Vietnam were addicted to heroin when they came back. Okay, they were smoking it or tooting it. They'd get, get what's called a stomach jones. Okay. So that war continued, uh, you know, I, I think until a military industrial complex kind of milked it for all it was worth and until white middle America took to the streets. 
Okay? 1975, it ended. Now I'm going to tell you about my story because this is where I come into the picture. Uh, I come from a CIA family. I was born in Washington, D.C. My father was an Air Force officer. He worked for Martin Marietta, uh, building the Titan Three Cs, which put up the Keyhole spy satellites. My father's cousin, Barbara, uh, was CIA. Her husband, Sam, had been OSS even before CIA. Uh, they both did 25, 30 years uh, and retired from the agency. My mother had been uh, Army Intelligence working in the code-breaking section in the Pentagon during the Second World War. So I come from a family of spooks, and I will tell you, it was a dysfunctional family. Um, <laughs> I was an honors student, an honors, I'm an honors graduate in political science from UCLA. Uh, I went there from 69 to 73, and I was one of two living Republicans on the UCLA campus during those years. <laughs> The other one was a guy by the name of Craig Fuller. Now, I was chosen to intern for Chief Ed Davis at LAPD, having been groomed and having already been spotted as, you know, part of the, you know, the, uh, what, the establishment, the in crowd, the, you know, an up and comer. Craig was chosen to intern for Governor Ronald Reagan. Craig was George Bush's chief of staff during Iran Contra. As I was chosen to intern for Chief Davis, I began. To, I was exposed to people from Army Intelligence and an operation known as Garden Plot. I was told that I had a Q clearance when I was 20 years old, and I had to go home and ask my father what the hell a Q clearance was. I didn't know. In the Organized Crime Intelligence Division, I got exposed to one guy in particular by the name of John Xavier Vock, and I was told that he had, or he was, a CIA-connected guy in LAPD. Well, it gets to where I'm just about ready to graduate from UCLA in 1973. I'm, uh, you know, magna cum laude, and the world is my oyster. I had interned for LAPD for three years. My family buys me a plane ticket. I go back to Washington, D.C., and I go for an interview with the CIA in the old executive office building. And here's this guy behind this desk with this huge CIA emblem on the wall behind him. And he says, uh, Mike, I've looked at all your stuff. You're just a wonderful kid. You've got a great background. You're in great shape. You, you know, blah, blah, blah. What we'd like you to do is to graduate from UCLA, join the CIA as a case officer, and a case officer is the highest rank within the agency. You know, that's, that's the highest level. There are levels above that, but, you know, that's, that's the creme de la creme. And we want you to then, after you're a, a CIA case officer, go back and go through the Los Angeles Police Department Academy, and LAPD will be your cover. I sat through the interview, and I got a stack of papers about that thick for my clearances, and I said, thank you very much, and I came back to L.A., and I threw them away, and I said, that's illegal. I don't want anything to do with that. I joined LAPD in 1973, was valedictorian in my academy class, went to work in an area called the Jungle, which is down near Crenshaw and Martin Luther King. Um, was having a great time. I was a good cop. I loved it. I never had so much fun in my life. I mean, it was what I wanted to do, and I thrived on it. I, I specialized in narcotics. And then I met and fell in love with a CIA agent. She came to my regular old cop bar, and we met and fell in love. This is what we call the unofficial re recruitment. Uh, it's, it was more fun than the one in the office, I'll tell you that. Um, and she knew people in LAPD's intelligence divisions. I didn't even know who they were. She kept mentioning this general by the name of Lee Goforth. And I'm going, well, who the heck is he? Well, he's a general, and he deals with terrorists. Oh, God, that well, sounds great. Then she'd mention organized crime figures, Carlos Marcello, New Orleans, Hank Friedman, Dan Horowitz, and um, other names like that. And then she'd tell me things out of my confidential personnel package at LAPD. There are two packages, one in your division and a master one at Parker Center. And then after a while, when we got engaged, um, she said, I work for the government. My people are very interested in having you go to work for me, or for us. Uh, bada bing, bada boom. And then she started taking trips. And she'd come back from Hawaii, and she'd say, yeah, I was in this room, and there were 50 kilos of cocaine and close to 1,000 M16s. Now, me being a narc, oh, by the way, by the way, LAPD, when I was in Watson, I confronted John Deutsch, said, he's never worked narcotics. Okay. United States Department of Justice Drug Enforcement Administration. Michael Craig Rupert, that's me. I didn't get it for writing parking tickets. I just wanted to do that in case LAPD was there. Um, I said, look, if I'm ever in a room with 50 kilos of cocaine, somebody's going to jail. I mean, 
what's wrong with you people? I mean, here I had been on loan to Wilshire Narcotics a few times writing search warrants, happy to get an ounce, and she's talking about 50 keys, and I, you know, I'm, wow. And, uh, <clears throat> no, we never touch the drugs. What? No, we don't touch the drugs. We kind of follow the guns. Okay? I'm not going to get involved in anything that overlooks drugs. Well, she related the same stories as having occurred in Baja, California, in Del Rio, Texas, in the Bahamas, in New Orleans. And I kept saying, oh, it was long before Mina. This was in 1976. We hadn't even got to Mina yet. <coughs> and I kept saying, I'm not going to, you know, and I thought, it was, I thought it was some kind of test. You know, I thought they were testing my integrity. I'm not going to do anything that overlooks drugs. Forget it. I'm a cop. Anyway, uh, after a while, it became clear that I was not going to roll over, and she disappeared <laughs> very suddenly. Right after she disappeared, a bunch of Italian thugs walked into my mother's real estate office. And then I found myself on loan to Organized Crime Intelligence Division. And who do I wind up working with but a guy named Lee Goforth, who was the senior detective, Detective 3 in Organized Crime Intelligence and a Brigadier General in the California National Guard. He was also LAPD's representative to LEIU, Law Enforcement Intelligence Unit, which is very heavily influenced by uh, the alphabet soup. His younger partner, Norm Bonneau, and who's in uh, OCID, but John Xavier Bach. So now I'm having all kinds of weird things happen. Hang up phone calls, burglaries, I'm getting followed. I have to spy on my mother, you know, get, gather intelligence. This is a little stressful. Um, in 1977, I got burglarized. Now, she left saying that someone was trying to kill her, and that was the cover. Somebody stole one of my guns. Somebody stole a photograph of her. And somebody got an address that I had just gotten on her in New Orleans. So my captain, who was uh, to, to this day one of the finest men I've ever known, a guy by the name of Jesse Brewer, who was the black police uh, commissioner here in Los Angeles during the time of the riots, a wonderful human being, went to bat for me. He says, look, OCID is lying. What do you want? Take a vacation. I went to New Orleans, and that was the biggest mistake of my life. I got to New Orleans, and she's got an apartment with a scrambler phone. And I didn't know what it was. It's just like this eight-pound telephone, you know, that looks like a normal phone. And then, but it has a little thing that you plug into a wall socket, you know, and you plug that in. And, then, you know, I had to describe it later, years later to an Air Force officer. He says, that's a KY-3. At the time, it required a TS clearance, a TS or crypto clearance. She had this black night vision device that she carried around in a paper bag. Naval and Air Force NCOs from Bell Chase Naval Air Stations were bringing her communiques. And it was funny because they'd be in civilian clothes, but they'd have the military shoes on and their military ID card sticking up out of their shirt pocket. I mean, great disguise. <laughs> and they'd bring these sealed communiques. And then there was this guy named Freddie who had been a veteran of the uh, 3rd Battalion, 5th Special Forces, uh, who she went out with at night. And I got to meet a whole bunch of people who worked for a company named Brown and Root. Major CIA contractor. They built Camron Bay. They are the, the, one of the major homes of sheep dipped employees. For those of you who don't know what sheep dipping is, uh, it's when C CIA takes a guy out of the uh, agency spy school and puts them in IBM or some company as their cover to go travel around the world. So all these people are shipping out for Iran. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention that Teddy grew up with the, the niece of the Shah of Iran. And uh, she used to get letters all the time from Iran. And uh, Teddy was American. <clears throat> and uh, one time the Shah's nephew, Sharyar, came and picked her up, took her out to dinner. So anyway, I'm watching her make arrangements for all kinds of guns to leave. And then later I'm hearing her make arrangements for certain packages to be dropped off on oil rigs in the Gulf. And they would be stashed on the oil rigs down on the pilings and bubble heads, as they call them, deep sea divers, hard hats, would go down and pull up the packages of heroin at the same time that a service boat coming out to bring food would arrive at the oil rig, not subject to customs search. And the divers would just toss the heroin on, and the whole, Carlos Marcello controlled the whole dock operation in New Orleans. So here I saw, and CIA was, the name CIA was dropped six or seven times while I was there. I saw scrambled communications and letterheads and all this stuff. So they were controlling an operation where guns were going out and drugs were coming in. This was in 1977. So after eight days, I said uh, goodbye. I'm leaving. I don't want anything to do with you people. And f for those of us who have been through this, it is a very painful loss of innocence. I can't tell you how painful it is to begin to discover that your country is really dirty. And you do it in stages. You don't let go all at once. 
I came back. I told everybody to leave me alone, uh, and they wouldn't. I kept getting followed, uh, chased. I got shot at once in New Orleans. And I wound up uh, going into a hospital for stress, basically because OCID said they were going to commit me under one of their psychiatrists. So I said, okay, I'm going into my own hospital, and I got tested eight ways from Sunday, and uh, they said I was perfectly sane, and I fought a little battle. It was injured on duty. I returned, was uh, earned the highest rating reports possible in LAPD, was about to be promoted, was on staff at the police academy, and the Iranian Revolution broke loose. And uh, I started to make some more connections, and that's when I started getting death threats and burglarized. I wound up taking a tape-recorded death threat, and I asked to see Chief Darrell Gates. Where do you go if organized crime intelligence is lying to you? And LAPD, they, you know, there is no place else you go but the chief. And I said, I got a problem because Daryl Gates had just been made chief and his bodyguard driver was a guy by the name of John Xavier Vach. And I said, I can't see Daryl Walt Vach there because he's CIA. And I got a message back from uh, Sergeant Pickering, a friend of mine who had relayed the message. Well, the chief realizes that Somebody may be trying to kill you. He's kind of busy. He can give you five or ten minutes in a week or ten days. Would you like to make an appointment? I want to show you something. I'm going to be giving this out at the press conference at the uh, rally that we're doing this weekend. This is from the Los Angeles Times. And the date on this is November 17th, 1984. Officers moonlighting probed. If you read this, it talks about a detective who went back to organized crime intelligence named John Xavier Bach. And then it says, it says here, it says, copies of official records of the California Department of Justice that contain information about criminal history of members of the Jewish Defense League according to uh, the government code. Uh, uh, okay, I turned over a transcript of the conversation between Glowley and Earl to employee of the Central Intelligence Agency who Rapaski identified as Jack Harmeyer. He was moonlighting for the Central Intelligence Agency on city time, and he was convicted in municipal court. Okay? No corroboration for my story whatsoever, right? Not according to the L.A. Times. I had alleged in 1978 that he was CIA. Okay? Um, so I wound up resigning. I got an attorney, and I, I got an attorney who was a former FBI intelligence agent, <clears throat> Don't hold it against me. Look, we have to learn. I was way ahead of you guys on this. You know, this was in 78. I went to the FBI. I went to Sam Hayakawa, Bob Dornan, Alan Cranston. Uh, Sam Hayakawa was a very gracious and wonderful gentleman. He was the only elected official who ever went to bat for me in all these years. He is the only one who ever did. Um, anyway, got on the record wherever I could, and I documented everything I had seen in New Orleans. To sum up the points that I made in a four and a half hour complaint to the FBI that I later made to a reporter, David Rosenzweig, at the LA Times, who until recently was assistant managing editor of the LA Times, to uh, all the Congress people, to everything else, I said, Carlos Marcello, guns, drugs, CIA, Hawaii, California, Mexico, submarines, Texas, Louisiana, terrorists, and, and rebel groups. That was in 1978. Item from the Los Angeles Times. You're going to love this one. Guns for drugs trade booming, reports disclose. From Newsday. Times didn't write it, but they reprinted the story from Newsday. Okay. And what it says is, Carlos Marcelo, guns, drugs, terrorist groups, Baja California, submarines, Texas, Louisiana, the Bahamas, and everything I had said a year before. The L.A. Times said, there's no story here. No corroboration. David Rosenzweig, after this came out, was promoted from staff writer to assistant city editor. Okay. I called the writer for that story, Tom Renner, and I mentioned the name Bonneau, and he said, wait a minute, LAPD, Bonneau? Turned through his pages. I've got this guy Bonneau's name in connection with a CIA machine gun factory in Mexico. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. So he says, call this investigator, Bill Christensen who's working for DeConcini's Committee on Improvements in Judicial Machinery. Great name. So I call Christensen up, and I run through all this stuff. Now I know CIA is dealing drugs. They're protecting Marcello. They're hand in glove. They're partners, and CIA is profiting from the deals. Okay? I call Christensen. I, I lay it out. He says, you're right. My offices are bugged. I'm getting followed. We were burglarized last week. This is a Senate investigator. 
This is 1979. Okay. He says, we'll get you back here to testify. That was the first time I was promised I could testify. Short time later, I had to start looking for a job. I was a writer, and I'd been laid off from one writing job, and I couldn't find a job anywhere in this city, and I would see unmarked LAPD cars turning up outside of places where I go for interviews. After about three weeks, I took a job at a 7-Eleven store because I needed to eat. My first day on the job, somebody calls up and says, is Mike Rupert working today? My second day on the job, I was arrested for selling liquor to a minor. Um, the second time I was shot at after that, I was dead drunk. I was on my lawn. I mean, I really didn't care much anymore. And uh, somebody shot at me. I didn't even bother to report it at that time. You know, I was just ready to give up. But you can't give up. That's what I found out. Um, I wish I had a choice. I really do wish I had a choice. So I kept pursuing and pursuing and pursuing. And eventually... One reporter from the days when we had a paper in this town. <laughs> Randall Sullivan. I made the front page of the Herald Examiner two Sundays in a row, October 11th and October 18th, 1981. There's a full page. I love this part. It says, Mike Cooper, perhaps LAPD's most intelligent officer. I really like that one. If I'm so intelligent, what am I doing this for? Okay, it lays out all the stuff about CIA, and it actually even finally mentioned down here after the end of two parts in two weeks, CIA dealing drugs. So I am on the record in October of 1981. I even have documents back from the FBI saying that I said it back in 1980. So I, you know, I do have a claim to some seniority here. Um, what that gets me, I have no idea. Um, now, by this time, Ronald Reagan is president. Craig Fuller is assistant to President Reagan for Cabinet Affairs. Craig Fuller's name turns up in this article. I, got a, I had a letter from Craig. Anytime you're in Washington, come and see me. I'd love to see you. So I fly back with part two under my arm. October 26th, 1981, I'm invited into the West Wing of the White House. And I get into Craig's office in the basement. Now, the Senate was going to say that, uh, uh, the Senate Intelligence was going to say I was never there because two original White House letters were burglarized from my home just three months ago. The same day that a senior investigator for Senate Select, Al Cummings, called me and asked me if I had original letters on White House stationery. He's been very helpful, by the way, though. I mean, he told LAPD he was doing an active investigation. Yeah, we were trying to get these letters, and, and everything Mike says is true, and, and uh, we had trouble faxing them and all kinds of shit. Excuse me, I said a bad word. Um, <laughs> So anyway, I get into Craig's office, and just for the record, Craig's office, if you're looking at the West Wing, you go in through the portico, you take a hard right past the receptionist, and on the far side of the reception area, there is a very steep and narrow staircase because it's built over so many years. You go down to the bottom of the staircase, you take a hard right and come back, and he had the corner office facing Pennsylvania Avenue and 17th. Tell me I wasn't there. Okay. I sat in his office, and we talked for a while, and then I said... Craig, you know, CIA is really heavily infiltrated LAPD, and CIA is complicit in bringing drugs into this country, and it's wrong. Now, I'll tell you exactly what Craig said. <laughs> he did not move. He did not breathe. He did not anything until I changed the subject. Okay? Not... Oh, my God, I'm a public servant. What you're alleging is a great outrage to the American people. It's an offense to the Constitution and any sense of decency possessed by any human being anywhere in the world. Not, my God, this is terrible. Somebody needs to look into this. This is awful. He just sat stone silent. And then George Bush made him his chief of staff in the second Reagan term. Now, I remember walking out of the White House and saying to myself, self, where do I go now? So I came back to Los Angeles, and it was one of several times I tried to put all this behind me. And, of course, events just kept catching up again because in 1981, Oliver North was just getting started. Now, in January of 82, I went to UCLA, which was my school, and I sought out the ranking expert on Middle East affairs in the political science department, a guy named Paul Jabber. You're going to love this, one, this story. 
So I go to Paul Jabber's office. Now, by now I've pieced some stuff together about why the guns are going and where they're going. And I've narrowed it down to probably the Kurds, maybe the Baluchis, um, and it had to do with arming a group in Iran to fight somebody, excuse me, uh, mildly in connection maybe with the revolution, but I wasn't sure. But I had names of people like Shackley, and we'll get to that in a minute. So he says, my God, Mike, your analysis is brilliant. Did you know, by the way, that I was a CIA consultant and a State Department consultant for Jimmy Carter? <laughs> Jerry, I feel like God's following you around with this stuff. And I said, no. And he said, listen, I have secrecy oaths and I have these agreements that I've signed. I can't tell you outright. But why don't you go read the New York Times on these dates, articles by C.L. Schultzberger and William Sapphire. And look, at, look up the Kurds and tell me what you think. So I went and did it, and I, and I pieced it all together. And what happened was, in March 3, 1975, March 3, 1975, April 1975 is when Saigon fell. Remember the context of history. March 3, 1975, the Shah of Iran and Saddam Hussein signed the Treaty of Algiers. We had been arming the Kurds for decades to fight against Iraq so that Iraq could not attack Israel. Okay? through Iran. And what the Shah said was, Saddam, if you give me the Shah al Arab waterway, I can double my oil exports, and I'll cut off all aid to the Kurds, and you can massacre them, and then your army's free to do whatever you want to do. So they shook hands at the Treaty of Algiers, March 3rd, 75. Within weeks, about eight, eight to 10,000 Kurds were massacred. So I pieced it together, and I went back to, to Paul Jabber, and I said, well, what happened was then, in order to keep the Kurds alive, they used the opium smuggling routes, Kurdistan being, by the way, the second largest opium growing region in the world, to smuggle out opium, which was made into heroin and sold here to buy the guns to keep the Kurds alive. He says, you're absolutely right. The decision was made at the National Security Council level. Read that, folks. That's the White House. To sell heroin to American citizens to keep the Kurds alive. Okay? Maybe that was just Right on. Did you, you guys pay him or what? Okay. Remember Southeast Asia here when I said some names like Ted Shackley, Tom Kleins, Richard Secord? What happened in 1975? The Vietnam War ended. Ted Shackley moved and became Deputy Director of Central Intelligence in charge of covert operations for the Middle East. Richard Secord was transferred to Iran as the air attache. Richard Armitage was transferred to Iran on missions connected with banking and finance. Is this beginning to sound familiar here? Is there a pattern shaping up here somewhere? Okay. The same players from Southeast Asia moved to Iran. The same players from Iran in 1980 moved into Pakistan when the Russians invaded Afghanistan. Everywhere these people go, there is a huge boom in the drug trade. Pakistan, before the invasion by the Soviets hadn't supplied zero or had supplied zero percent of American heroin. In Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Well, no, that, they invaded Afghanistan, but all, of, all the American supply operations were run from Pakistan. The Mujahideen were armed through American bases in Pakistan over into the border. By the middle of that conflict, 40 to 60 percent of the heroin in this country was coming from guess where? Pakistan. Duh. Um, so now we move to Iran-Contra. The Boland Amendment says no more lethal aid to the Contras. Cut them off. Reagan says we'll go private. Okay. Oliver North, by the way, started to get involved back in Iran and Pakistan. He starts cropping up. Now we have the Contra supply operation. And who do we find? Oh, by the way, John Singlaub went to the Middle East, too. Now, who do we find cropping up in Iran Contra? John Singlau, Richard Secord, Ted Shackley, Richard Armitage, all the same people, Oliver North. Again, the same people for 40 years, 50 years, have been doing the same thing. Okay? Now we get to Iran Contra. And I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on all the stuff that's already out. I will give you one specific case illustrating, and that's the case of Juan Ramon Mata Ballesteros of Honduras. And during the early years of the Iran era, Iran Contra era, Honduras was supplying approximately 50% of the cocaine consumed in this country. 
through Mata Ballesteros. Dewey Claridge, CIA station chief, had contracted with Mata's airline, Setco, for exclusive contracting for counter supply operations. DEA station in Honduras was ordered closed in 1982. Juan Ramon Mata Ballesteros was very closely connected with a Mexican cartel run by Felix Gallardo and Rafael Caro Quintero. Everybody remember Kiki Camarena? Kiki Camarena was investigating Gallardo and Quintero. He was chasing a CIA drug ring when he was murdered. And I have found one of the men, the CIA agents, who was on the mission where Kiki was murdered. And we're going to get into that in a second. Now, I want to backtrack a little bit. A lot has been overlooked about the role of the U.S. military in drug dealing, as ordered by the CIA. Over 20 years of my investigations, what I see is several things. First of all, what I call the shadow government, which includes many agencies, DIA, Defense Department, NSA. You know, they're everywhere, okay? Um, had used large components of the military. Uh, many people here, uh, let me ask, is anyone here familiar with the Watchtower missions? I see a couple of hands. Okay. Watchtower missions took place in the mid and late 70s. Elements of the 7th Special Forces Group, Airborne, were ordered from Panama by a guy by the name of Edwin Wilson, on orders from a guy by the name of Tom Kleins, Ted Shackley's deputy. Ted Shackley is now out of the agency. To take special action teams into Colombia and plant radar beacons so the cocaine flights can fly below radar and land at Albrook Airfield in Panama. Special Forces troops were there, including one William Tyree, as Manuel Noriega meets the aircraft, along with Ed Wilson and a guy named Michael Harari of the Israeli Mossad. Okay? There were three series of these missions, each commanded by a different Special Forces colonel. All of these Special Forces colonels are dead. Actually, there are five Special Forces colonels who have been murdered. Baker, Roe, Cutolo, Malvesti, and Bayard. Okay? There was, <clears throat> it centers around an affidavit called the Cutolo Affidavit. These are some of my documents relevant to Watchtower. And I'll tell you right up front that the affidavit of Ed, Ed Cutolo Colonel at 10 Special Forces, he went from the 7th to the 10th, this is the cover sheet, was not written by Colonel Edward Cutolo. One of the reasons why I know that is because he refers to the Panamanian Defense Forces, and Ed Cutolo was murdered in 1980, and they weren't named uh, the Panamanian Defense Forces until 85. Okay? But everything in his affidavit has been corroborated. He left files with people at the NSA. And I know who the people are, but we're not going to discuss names there. Um, Every aspect of the Watchtower missions has been corroborated independently by other affidavits. <coughs> we fast forward to 1978-79, 80. Cutolo is now commander of 10 Special Forces Group Airborne at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. We have an operation known as Orwell. Due to the massive CIA drug operations, they were afraid of leaks. Now, remember, when I left LAPD, it was November 30th, 1978. Orwell was at its peak then. Uh, Army Security Agency. Special Forces personnel, military intelligence personnel were ordered to bug and wiretap courthouses, politicians, anybody who had any knowledge. We have affidavits from people who pulled mics out of courthouse walls in uh, Massachusetts. They did uh, John Kerry. They did Tip O'Neill. They did uh, anybody, any politician who might expose these operations. Now, we have a Sergeant Bill Tyree who's on these missions, who had been on the missions in Central America, who had been ordered to do these surveillances. And he wanted out. He got sick to his stomach. He had enough. This was not American to him. His wife had been keeping diaries. They murdered his wife. And they framed him for it. We have affidavits from people saying he wasn't even at the murder scene. We have a letter from the, from the district attorney who prosecuted the case, who was gay, who was being blackmailed by special forces, saying, please destroy the videotape showing the murderer other than Tyree coming out of the bedroom window. Okay, there's so much proof that he's been in prison now 18 years. I talked to him yesterday. Okay, and as we move along with this case, we get more and more information about Watchtower. This, I will hold up for you here, this is what the Army has to say about Watchtower.
And then they say it, it never existed. Just, you know, it just wasn't there. Uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, if I can find it quickly, and I probably can't, but I have documents that he got from the Central Intelligence Agency, says there was no Watchtower mission. It's a six-page letter in response to his Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, they go through three and a half pages of there is no Watchtower and bada-bing, bada-boom. And, and then it says at the end, we are reviewing all of our Watchtower documents because we've had so many requests for them. And as soon as it, then they wrote him and said, can we have our last letter back? Believe it or not, they did. These people are not as smart as we give them credit for. They use fear as a tool. Okay. There is so much evidence about Watchtower, and I have spoken to many Special Forces people. This came out, by the way, through Bo Greitz, who I've met several times. Uh, after Paul Neary of the National Security Agency died of natural causes, it was forwarded to Bo, and Bo started to release it in the early 90s. Um, and there is a ton. I mean, if this guy ever gets a trial, he's free. And in my speech Saturday at the rally, I'm going to be talking about Bill Tyree. I'm going to be talking about the 12 or so members of Special Forces who have shared with me the shame they carry, okay, for, at having been ordered to do things like this. Um, now I want to get to someone who's even going to make you feel worse, if that's possible. Ah, thank you. Pardon me, I'm going to hit the glass. This is a guy that I get to take credit for discovering all by myself. Again, I have such wonderful luck. <clears throat> Colonel Albert Vincent Caron. In this copyrighted report that I wrote in 1994, I called him the missing link between Iran-Contra cocaine operations and organized crime. This man was 20 years with the New York Police Department, a detective who happened to be involved in a couple of very key NYPD cases known as the French Connection and the Prince of the City, for which my colleague Jimmy Rothstein, a retired NYPD detective, deserves great credit as having uncovered the CIA links to both cases. Okay. This is a picture of Colonel Albert Caron after his retirement from NYPD. He was caught sodomizing two 12-year-old boys, and they gave him a pension. <clears throat> He had been a bagman and a CIA operative for his whole career. He is the counterpart in NYPD for what they wanted me and others to do at LAPD. Except for, this guy died, by the way, in 1990. I've held his personal phone book in my hand. Let me backtrack again. The death certificate when he died, we call it the CIA flu. The, the, the death certificate read, Chemical Toxicity of Unknown Etiology. His liver and brain self-destructed over a period of six months, and no doctor of about 11 doctors who treated him could figure out what was causing it. <clears throat> I've held his phone book in my hand, Colonel Albert Caron. And in that phone book, I found William Casey's home phone number in Locust Valley, Long Island. I found the home phone number for Polly Castellano. Anybody know who Polly Castellano is? He's the guy who took over the Gambino crime family. Matty the Horse Ionello. Pete LaCavoli. More mobsters than you can shake a stick at. Now, I found a couple of other names in the phone book. Go back to Southeast Asia. Remember what I wrote on the board up here? Paul Hellowell and Richard Stilwell. Home phone numbers. Also key players in a bank called the Nugent Hand Bank out of Australia, which was the CIA's drug bank who had Bill Colby as its chief counsel. Uh, this is a clue. This is a clue. Okay. He went on a mission to Mexico in 1985 with a guy named James Robert Strauss. I have no idea how long I've been going. Uh, okay. James, James Robert Strauss who uh, used to brag about having taken quiet walks on the beach with Richard Nixon. I hope they weren't too close. Um, and he came back from this mission saying, my God, we killed two DEA agents. We massacred a whole bunch of innocent civilians in Chiapas. You know that there's a revolution going on in Chiapas now. And I lost my stomach. I can't do this anymore. He had been laundering cocaine profits from the CIA through the mafia 
for about 25, 30 years. And he lost his stomach. You know, not after sodomizing the boys or killing people or anything, but when two DEA agents finally killed, something clicked, something is wrong. Do we have any other evidence? By the way, here is a, one of the pages from one of his surviving passports. If anybody knows about anything about passports, he had a black one, he had a maroon one, he had a green one, and he had a blue one in three different names. Here's a passport stamp showing three-day circuits from John F. Kennedy to London Heathrow to Nassau, the Bahamas. Could he have been laundering stuff? I don't know. We have some bank account numbers at NetWest. National Bank of Westminster and Coots and Co., one of which is still live. His daughter has it. We have military records. We have travel records um, from, from Strauss Downing & Associates. His partner had an insurance company. But for a guy who sold insurance domestically, why would he need to go to Johannesburg, Hong Kong, London, Kuala Lumpur, Seoul, Duanda, Duanda Angola, the Jersey Islands, they do a lot of laundering in, in the Jersey Islands off the British coast. Casablanca, Madrid. I mean, I got five pages of travel records. Okay. When Albert Caron died of chemical toxicity of unknown e etiology, several things happened. Every military record of the guy disappeared. His New York police pension disappeared. His bank accounts disappeared. His insurance policies disappeared. His driver's license record in New Mexico disappeared. Every record of this man was sanitized in the space of three weeks. His daughter, Dee Caron Ferdinand, who I love dearly and who is one of my closest friends, was left utterly broke and bankrupt, wiped out. She wrote to Pete Domenici's office and you know, sent a picture of this photograph saying my father was a colonel. And the Army said he was a sergeant in World War II, and that's what they buried him as, a master sergeant. Pete Domenici's office called her back and said he rented the uniform. Okay. All right. Well, then we'll just have to assume that 12 years earlier he rented a uniform as a major <clears throat> with exactly the same decorations. Hmm. She uh, really went to bat because everything was sanitized and she admits that her father was not a good man but everything that he had left her was wiped out and she lost probably twenty five thirty thousand dollars of her own money and she is dying to testify before congress i went out and met with her in ninety four and uh... ninety three actually and uh, gathered all this information wrote my report talked to the doctor uh, doctors, I mean, here's some of his diplomas from intelligence school and so on and so forth. And he was flying a lot of, he was involved with people flying drugs in and out of Mid Valley Airport, and Mid Valley is a counterpart to MENA. The only reason why MENA is so popular now is two reasons because of the size and quantity of drugs and because it was Bill Clinton's state. But there are many MENAs in this country. Don't confuse yourself here, folks. Many MENAs everywhere, okay? Um, so after doing all this investigation, photographing everything that I could, I said to her, well, from my research and all these years of study, there's only one guy in the world I can think of that you need to talk to who can help you do anything about your father's case. His name is Ted Shackley. By the way, did you know that Ted Shackley, when Oliver North ran for Senate, was leasing Oliver North office space for like $5 a month? No connection, no connection. So she finds a guy named Robert Mayhew, who's living in New Mexico. Mayhew puts her in touch with Shackley. Now, now her father's buried, in the, and the headstone reads, Staff Sergeant. After three years of trying to get that change to Colonel, she calls Ted Shackley. Six weeks later, the headstone says, Full Colonel. We have before and after photographs. We have a copy of the order, which she was... She's an Italian from Brooklyn. She stole it. What can I tell you? You know, we have a copy of the order directing the change. Okay? No connection. No connection whatsoever. This case, if we pull this one, we'll really pull it apart. But how many cases like that are there? There's dozens. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of cases. I want to talk about one more case. Anybody recognize this guy? Colonel Jim Sabo. 
Full Colonel, United States Marine Corps, Chief of Air Operations, El Toro Marine Air Station. Murdered in 1991. Now, what's significant about 1991? Cold War had been over for about four years, three years. Iran-Contra was over. Why was he murdered? This guy, by the way, was about as straight arrow as you can get, devout Roman Catholic. His wife went to Mass every day. He went, you know, every day that he could. Uh, the family man of doom, the best family man you could ever imagine. Spotless Marine Corps record. He caught C-130s flying on to El Toro with 1,000 kilo loads of cocaine. His brother is one of the main speakers at our rally on Saturday, Dr. David Sabo. Now, the Naval Investigative Service said that he committed suicide. Now, why did they say he committed suicide? Because he sent a bookcase to his son on a military flight that was flying empty from point A to point B. And they were going to ruin his career for that dishonor. It happens all the time, folks. If the space is empty anyway, who cares? You know, and he says, you're not going to do that to me. Uh, you know, he was going to blow the whistle. The, according to the Naval Investigative Service and the Marine Corps, Colonel Jim Sabre went out into his backyard with a 12-gauge shotgun, shoved it so hard into his mouth that he sheared off the uvula at the back of his throat. Now, if, you know, if you're going to commit suicide, why do you put yourself through all that stuff just to commit suicide? <clears throat> the funny thing about the Sabo murder case is that he aspirated blood for 10 minutes after they said he blew his brains out. Now think about that for a minute, folks. If you're dead, you're not breathing. How can you aspirate blood after you've killed yourself? It's impossible. They also found a deep skull fracture on the back of the skull right back here with a hematoma. You don't hematoma. It doesn't sound like it. It sounds like a dance. Um, it, you, you, you don't get hematomas if you're dead. That's a result of the body trying to heal itself and fluid rushing to the wound. Somebody knocked him out, boom, let him lie on the ground for 10 minutes with a skull fracture, inhaling blood before they shoved a shotgun so hard down his throat it sheared off his uvula. Okay? This report contains the reports of eight different forensic pathologists who have all said this man did not commit suicide, he was murdered. The brother, Dr. David Sabo, is a, is a medical doctor who lives in uh, South Dakota. He's been fighting this case nonstop since Jim was murdered. And he's winning some cases. His attorney now is Daniel Sheehan, who people have many mixed opinions about, who was the head of the Christic Institute back in the 80s, but Danny's doing a good job with this case. What happened with the Marine Corps and the Navy, as uh, Dr. Sabo tried to fight this, was uh, there were some loyal Marines who snuck out some records and some notes which said, get David Sabo. The Marine Corps went after his medical license, saying that he was uh, saying, you know, people should do illegal things. And, 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 of course, that didn't go anywhere. But they have the documented records about a strategy designed to make Dr. Sabo lose his medical license. They are uh, trying to move ahead with trial, and he just won a major decision in the U.S. Ninth Circuit here in California, not on the CIA issue, but granting him broad discovery to subpoena the military records regarding the cocaine activities. So, again, David Sabo will be one of our speakers Saturday, as will Sully Castillo. Mike Levine was supposed to come. He uh, uh, it wound up with 102 temperature yesterday after testifying for about two weeks in San Diego in a case where two agents murdered a sailor down there. And he's been ordered back to New York to go to bed. So we're going to miss Mike, but he's here in spirit. So I guess what I want to say to you is this. This is bigger than any of us think. They've been flying in drugs all over this country. They've been dealing drugs to Americans for 40 or 50 years. But go back to the analogy that I gave you before about the drunk on a binge. Okay. We can see that it's been getting worse and worse and worse. They have utterly corrupted the criminal justice system. When we have a guy like Stanley Sporkin sitting on the U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C., you know who Stanley Sporkin is? Retired chief counsel for the Central Intelligence Agency. He sits on the bench on the U.S. District Court in Washington. His email messages read to Stanley from Ali during the Iran-Contra era. 
You want to talk about a choke point to control key cases? Um, I have spoken to people who used to work for a company called E-Systems in Texas. I see old Bob going crazy over there about E-Systems. Um, their children, one of them had, had had her son murdered because she discovered E-Systems. E-Systems makes all the encryption devices for the NSA and CIA. There is not a secret that the government has that E-System does not also have. Sitting on the board of directors of E-Systems is Admiral William Rayborn, retired director of Central Intelligence. We have documented E-Systems CIA flights dropping massive loads of cocaine into Lake Tawakoni, landing at the E-Systems airport in Garland, Texas. Okay, there is proof. There is an enormous amount of proof. What do we do? Okay, what do we do? All right, 20 years. I'm going to share with you my experience, strength, and hope, having looked at this for 20 years, being a graduate of political science from UCLA, having knocked on every door. There isn't a thing you can think of that I haven't tried. Okay, I'm going to tell you what we do. And I'll tell you that There were times for me in the 20 years that I've had incredible depressions, incredible heartache, incredible disillusionment, utter hopelessness, knowing and believing that I was going to die and never see a day of justice. And I'll tell you, I think I'm beginning to understand how a slave felt knowing that he was going to die and that neither he nor his children would ever have any hope of seeing freedom. And there were times when I thought, and I used to manage the largest gun store in the state, B&B. &B. And uh, I got so much good information out of B&B because &B we sold to all these feds and they'd come in. I'd say, yeah, come on back and shoot this MP5. And the guy would just start blabbering all kinds of stuff to me. It was wonderful. <laughs> there were times when I wanted, like others, and I will not criticize them, to go to the hills. You know, I have no family. I've never had children. I was told that if I ever had children, they'd kill them. Then I thought about going to the hills and giving up and waiting just for a chance to go out fighting. But I will tell you what I have learned in 20 years, that it takes more courage to stand up and talk than it does to fight. Um, What is happening now, and in a minute or so, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Novick from the Co Crack the CIA Coalition. What I see happening now is a potential miracle of biblical proportions. I happen to believe in God. I have a higher power. I could not be sober 14 years otherwise. Um, I do not believe that my God has ordained for me suffering. I don't believe that he has ordained an Armageddon. I don't believe that he has asked me to do anything but to do the right thing in faith one day at a time. What's going to happen Saturday is that, in one sense, the lion is going to lay down with the lamb. These people who are in the crack the CIA coalition, of which I have been a part now for, I guess, about a month or so, six weeks, whatever, are people you would not ordinarily associate with. On a daily basis, I work hand in hand with a former Black Panther. Okay? There are people from socialist organizations, and there are people from labor parties, and there are black militants, and there are um, Indians and Hispanics and Democrats, you know. <laughs> And I want you to know something. These people are standing up for you. These people plan to go to the street to say CIA is dealing drugs and it's wrong. And they plan to stand up, which is the most courageous act we can do to go to the street and exercise First Amendment rights. And they're doing it for you and me and the stockbrokers in New York and the rich housewives in St. Louis. And they're putting aside all of their differences, saying this is not about anything but right and wrong. Okay. See, what the agency, what the shadow government 
has done for so long is to pit us against each other black against white against rich against poor against gay against straight against cop again we we've been turned you know and we react last night i was on the show at kiev and this guy calls in and goes well, there's the communist conspiracy, and you've got Tom Hayden endorsing this, and my God, and, and you know, that the kind, they're going to start violence, and it's the communist take. And I said, wait a minute, hold it, just, just a minute. You know, sure, there were communists, and they weren't good people, but how about the fact that we brought all these Gestapo and SS into our special forces and our central intelligence agency? Those are Nazis. I said, why don't we just do this like I'm a cop? I don't care what political party a bad guy belongs to. I just want to make the arrest. You know? If we can do what I'm hoping we can do on Saturday, we will have 10, 15,000 people in the streets. And I pray to God, Summer, you were there. And there are people coming from various parts of the country. And there are people from the right as well. And we can have a show of Americans standing up in the street for American rights so that when we do get justice, everybody can go back to doing their own thing. But if we do not hang together, we shall all surely hang separately. Okay. We're trying to do something which is really dangerous. And if we pull it off, we're going to scare the bad guys to death. Okay. We are going to make a statement when they look through the crowd and see who's there and see that we can pull this off nonviolently, peacefully, with enthusiasm and cooperation. This is something that hasn't been done. It takes more courage to stand up than it does to fight. It takes more courage to talk and to say, I believe, and I am willing to say, you are wrong, because we're afraid of the ostracism. Well, let's stand up together and see if we can't change something. I'm going to call up on Mike, and we'll let him talk for a few minutes. Then we'll take questions. Talk about a tough act to follow. That's a pretty amazing uh, set of uh, facts, but really the, the life that this man has lived to come to this moment and be here with us, I think, is incredible. And uh, I really want to thank Mike for his, his tremendous courage and his openness to uh, just deal with the truth and to speak the truth and to, uh, you know, face the consequences of that. And I think it's something we all have to do. And uh, I am here basically tonight to tell you a little bit about the Crack the CIA Coalition and uh, about the demonstration. Uh, there are flyers here, and we'd like to urge you to take some flyers and pass them out in the next day or two to bring people. Uh, we want this to be uh, as massive and as broad and as open and as democratic a demonstration as is possible to have. Um, we have a set of principles of unity, and the principles are that uh, we are opposed to the crimes that the CIA has committed against the people of this country and against other people around the world. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that has come very clear to us uh, in doing this work is that it's impossible to protect ourselves somehow by the use of agencies like the CIA because the crimes that they carry out supposedly in our name somehow to protect the American way of life are crimes committed against us every single day and that the crimes they committed in Nicaragua and the crimes they committed in uh, other parts of the world inevitably are going to affect us and and we see the destruction they, they've created, the devastation, not only in South Central Los Angeles, but in every village and hamlet in this country. And crack is not something now they thought that they could dump in one community and somehow destroy that community and not have it spread out throughout this society. So we're seeing tremendous uh, connections between what's going on. And, you know, people here I know have uh, uh, no love for uh, uh, Bill Clinton, I'm sure. and. Uh, I, I think it's important to understand that the people in this coalition are not uh, in any way part of the coalition that Bill Clinton represents. The people in this coalition are a coalition of forces trying to claim their humanity, defend themselves, to uh, recognize the need for solidarity to deal with this. And, uh, you know, I've been on talk radio and I used that word once and somebody said, when I hear that word solidarity, I want to lock and load. But I'm telling you that that's what you need, that if you want to deal with the CIA, if you want to deal with Bill Clinton, you have to recognize what they're about. And they're about an empire. 
And the problem with Bill Clinton is not whether you think he's a socialist or you think he's a moderate or you think he's this or that. Or what. Bill Clinton is an emperor. And that's the problem with Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton wants you to be subjects of his empire. And if you want to have any other status than as a subject of that empire, then you have to stand with the former Black Panthers in this coalition. And you have to stand up on Saturday and say that Bill Clinton and the CIA are not committing these crimes in your names or in our names. And that if we want to protect ourselves from those criminals, we have to take action with all the good people of South Central, the good people of East Los Angeles, the good people of the San Fernando Valley have to stand up together and say, we want a different and a better world together. So I would like to urge you to come out on Saturday. I would also like to urge you, if you have some funds to make available, I know that you all have your own uh, needs and demands, but as a representative of this coalition, uh, I'd like to give you the address for a moment. We have a P.O. Box. It's the Crack the CIA Coalition, and it's P.O. Box 191601, Los Angeles, California, 90019. We've been fronting out money to bring uh, Sally Castillo to Los Angeles, to bring uh, Dr. D David Sabo from uh, uh, South Dakota to Los Angeles, to bring documentation information and to put on this demonstration. And so uh, we want you definitely to come out and support. We want you to be a part of this process. We're not stopping tomorrow with the demonstration. The demonstration is the beginning. We are co-sponsoring on March 15th, and everyone who's here is certainly welcome to come a teach-in on all of this material uh, at Fairfax High School in the city of Los Angeles. That will be beginning, I believe, at 11 o'clock on uh, uh, March 15th, which is a Saturday in about three weeks. We're going to be having uh, Peter Dale Scott, the author of the books that uh, Mike Rupert mentioned, Cocaine Politics. We're going to be having Dr. Alfred McCoy, the author of this, uh, the leading book on this, what he referred to as the Bible. And all of this effort is the effort to expose these truths and these realities to all of you and to the rest of us to educate ourselves, to mobilize ourselves, and to support each other in this movement. And that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a movement to resist, to, to counter the lies, and to expose ourselves to some truths that, you know, uh, uh, People here, I certainly, you know, understand what's disseminated in the media bears very little re 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 relation to reality. But you might want to rethink some of the things that you have absorbed from those same media, uh, criminalizing and castigating and demonizing people on the left who might have something to share and something to offer you. Demonizing people who've stood up. There's a man named Michael Zinzen, for example, who is involved with the gang truce, the former Black Panther, not closely involved in this coalition. But he is somebody who... Uh, files were taken out of the, the LAPD to uh, prevent him from running for the city council in Pasadena. These crimes go on and on and on, and they will not be stopped unless people stand up and say no more. So we're trying to do that on one particular day, but in a very long-term way. And uh, we're happy to dialogue about these things, and I thank you for the time. I thank Michael for his tremendous presentation, and I, I think we all owe him a tremendous debt of gratitude. Okay, we're going to have there questions. Questions from the back of the room. So those of you who have questions, Mike will be glad to try and answer for you. Yes. So uh, yeah. please feel free to I'm ask sorry. any questions. The, the leaflet actually is only clear the question was asked. 12 noon at City Hall, downtown Los Angeles, 1st and Spring Street. We'll be marching from there to the L.A. Times, to the uh, Los Angeles Federal Building, and then back for a rally at City Hall. Uh, we have a permit. We obtained a permit. This, uh, we're marching uh, with po uh, the police at a distance, but uh, we, yeah, it's, a per it's, it's a completely legal march. It's, it's a completely nonviolent march. We're there to, uh, you know, express these truths and to uh, take a stand on these issues. M Mr. Rupert. Yes. You mentioned the secret government. Do you see the CIA as the ultimate executive, or whom is the ultimate executive? behind all the wrongdoing we see? I tend to be, when I answer, well, I'm always asked this question. And I tend to, I try to be fairly conservative because I try to approach this as a detective and answer with evidence that I have, okay? You recall I mentioned Paul Jabber, the UCLA political science professor? Shortly after I met with him, he left UCLA to become vice president of Bankers Trust. 
he took over as chair of the Middle East Department of the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, that's where I see a lot of this going. The more I try logically as a detective using intuitive, inductive logic to, to, to get to the bottom of this, I come to banks. That's where I come. I come to banks. And, of course, most of the banks are foreign-owned, especially follow the money. That's the bottom line. Um, do you know uh, if Brian Quigg is all right? I, I assume you know him. Who? Of Brian Quigg of Phoenix. He's the one with the Internet site with all this material that you have been speaking about this evening. Yeah, I'm not familiar with him. Oh, you don't know him? No. Um, the book, L.A.'s Secret Police. Mike is Roth that, Miller. Is that fairly accurate? Yes, I know Mike Roth Miller. Uh, and what's very interesting about that is that Mike touched on a couple of things. LAPD has been heavily, heavily infiltrated by CIA for a long time. Bill Parker, who was a legendary chief here, hated the FBI. And he invited CIA lock, stock, and barrel to come into LAPD. And then there are documented cases during the Iran-Contra era of one detective named Hamilton of organized crime intelligence coming off an airplane with the Mexico City, Mexico City chief of police, Arturo Durazo, who was under indictment for drug corruption from the Bahamas. What's an LAPD detective doing with the Mexico City Chief of Police on a flight from the Bahamas? Um, Daryl Gates made a statement in 1992 that the only position he would consider in a second Bush term would be Director of Central Intelligence. My question for Daryl is, what are your qualifications? Okay. Mike Rothmiller's book is good. He kind of stopped short of some other things, but he and I have, have spoken many, many times. So, yes, it's a good book. Uh, yes, I, I wonder what your opinion is of uh, um, the, I haven't heard you mention this, and I'm wondering why, the kind of pulls the rug out of all the law enforcement agencies around the country and uh, has been advocated by the uh, the uh, many judges and the um, and many doctors and many Jocelyn Elder uh, Ellen, uh, and is the the answer is the legalization of drugs and when uh, a lot of people here might not understand what I mean by this is that I'm not advocating the use of drugs but by the legalization of drugs, we're talking about many solutions for many problems in that many people, uh, billions of dollars are, that are spent chasing down criminals are freed up and, um, and, that, uh, and that many crimes committed by these so-called druggies are committed because it's legally gotten. I guess I'm wondering why, what your opinion. I mean, it just it's just the simple solution for a whole lot of problems, and I'm hoping everybody here thinks on this for a while because it is the awesome solution for this a whole lot of awesome problems. I uh, have thought about this a lot, and I will say that as a cop, what I what what really makes me feel good is when I hurt the bad guys. I'm sorry, that's the way I feel, you know my feel in my gut. Um, the way we hurt the bootleggers was to legalize alcohol. I do not advocate necessarily legalizing drugs, but maybe in certain cases decriminalizing drugs might be an answer. However, we're dealing with a situation. Historically, the British in the 1800s established their whole economy on a trilateral trade growing opium in India, selling it to the Chinese, getting silk, taking it back to Britain, and making textiles. And that set up the cash flow of the British economy. That's the model. The difference is now that we're poisoning ourselves, which is really ugly, okay? But there was a report, which I have not seen, but several congressional staffers who I know, and Bob, if he's still here, probably knows it too, prepared by the House Banking Committee, chaired by Henry Gonzalez, which said something like, if all the drug money were withdrawn, the eight largest banks in the Western Hemisphere would collapse. That would create a depression the likes of which this country had never seen before. So we have to use some thought in, a, in really how we approach the problem. So anyway. Yes, uh, the problem is not the CIA. The problem is organized crime, the Democrat and Republican Party. 
And uh, the, the real problem is that we do not have a policy of putting the cocaine cartel out of business and destroying the cocaine cartel. Instead, you're destroying the American people. So my question is, why aren't you putting the blame on the Democratic Republican Party and organized crime, and why aren't you pointing out that we have no policy to destroy the cocaine cartel? That's what you'd be using the, the opportunity Saturday morning for. I just was pointing out about the guy with the phone book with Polly Castellano and all of that, so I think I was talking about organized crime. Yes. Yes, uh, last night on Peter Ford's show, you uh, mentioned that you had sent uh, the material to Ross Perot, and he had called you twice, <laughs> but I don't know what he said. Could you elaborate a little more on that conversation? Yeah. In, uh, again, from the Los Angeles Times, This is what I do when I'm around the press. I've been published in the Los Angeles Times. I don't say anything unless I have it right in my hand and I back it up. The Los Angeles Times ran this story in 1987, January, about Ross Perot backing Rich Richard Armitage into a corner. If anybody knows Richard Armitage, he's 6'4 and bench presses 430 pounds. Okay? And this short little floppy-eared Texan with a big nose got him in a hallway in the Pentagon and backed him into a corner. And the issue was CIA dealing drugs, Armitage's involvement, and the POWs connected in Laos who were left behind. Okay. Ross Perot was sent to go see Vice President George Bush. And Bush said, go see the FBI and threw him out of the White House. Ross Perot cost Bush the 1992 election. Okay. Now, I wrote to Ross Perot in 1990. And I'm, I sent him all the stuff and my stories and everything. And one day the phone rings and, and it goes, Mr. Rupert, it's Ross Perot. How are you? And I'm going, Jesus. You know, and I just came out of my chair. It was him. And he said, I want you to know that I've read every word that you have sent me and no one has pursued this longer or harder than you have. You should give it up. <laughs> he said, I must know 20 or 30 former military officers and law enforcement officers who discovered the same thing and they all had their careers ruined, their lives ruined. They're, you know, everything. They do the same thing to everybody. You'd think they'd try something different. I do a pretty good Ross Perot after all this time. And uh, he said, but they don't because it works. And then Ross Perot said to me, Mike, even with all of my resources, I don't know why I pursue it. I can't get anywhere. The answer is not money. The answer is people in the street. The answer is people standing up together, expressing their will. Okay? Now, I will tell you a secret. I was the press spokesman for the parole movement in 92 here in Los Angeles County. Now, I've kind of parted ways with Ross just because of the way he pulled out, and I'm not going to go into that now. But what I saw in 1992, we had our little headquarters on Ventura Boulevard in Sherman Oaks. We had a list of 15,000 names of people who wanted to volunteer, people who had never voted before in their lives, people who had never held any hope that there was any way that their voice could be heard in this country. And what Ross Perot did was to tap into that wellspring of discontent, which is lying just beneath the surface in this country. And that's what we're trying to do with this rally and with this demonstration. It's there. We want to reach that critical mass so that, so that the people who know or suspect or just feel in their gut that something's wrong will come forward. Uh, Mr. Rupert, I hope I'm not uh, going over something that you already covered, but I came in late tonight. Uh, I want to know, uh, Daryl Gates made a statement that he was part of the CIA. Do, did you cover that, or do you know, and if so, what is his what was his job or what was he doing in 1962 I believe it was Daryl Gates was captain of LAPD's intelligence division and there's a well-respected author named Bill Turner who's a former FBI agent who's written a number of books and he describes this incident where a guy named Dennis Maurer was out with a bunch of uh, uh, right-wing paramilitary guys in the desert way north of Lancaster and they were throwing hand grenades around and shooting machine guns and you know having fun and up was Captain Daryl Gates of LAPD's Intelligence Division, way out of his jurisdiction, and says, knock it off. And they said to Daryl Gates, well, it's okay. CIA told us we could be here. They gave us the stuff. And he said, screw you. I am CIA. And I'm telling you to stop. Well, there was an undercover Long Beach policeman in that group who wrote a report which made it into the files. So that was the answer to that question. No. Mr. Ru Mr. Rupert? Yes. Yeah. 
I wonder if you could comment on reports that I have heard that a great deal of the money funding and indeed creating national coalition to ban handguns, handgun control incorporated, and various other activist groups and individuals in the gun grabbing, anti-constitutional, so-called gun control movement, are actually has its source in CIA affiliated and CIA front organizations as part of a calculated program to disarm the American people. I have not seen any direct evidence of that. But I fall back on the old line. If it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, and there's duck feathers everywhere, we've probably got a duck. One of the things that I have studied a lot is something called the Hegelian dialectic, which says you create a problem, and then you solve the problem, and in solving the problem, you get the end result that you were after to begin with. That, no, n nobody can dispute. Nobody can dispute the fact that we have seen utterly repressive laws, especially vis-a-vis -vis asset forfeiture, being imposed upon us. Laws which begin to scare me. And I have interviewed a guy whose father was a high-ranking official in the Abwehr, which was Adolf Hitler's intelligence service, uh, who was his grandfather. And he used to tell his grandson, who was now a very good friend of mine, if he didn't lose the Second World War, he just changed venues. Okay? So it's beginning to sound like that here, yes. Yes, uh, Mr. Rupert, you mentioned earlier that our economy has become hooked on drugs. I wonder to what degree our our major political parties have become hooked as well. Uh, how much drug money has flown in, has f flowed into campaign contributions, do you think? Again, I don't have any direct information on that, and I really only answer stuff that I know directly, but there is so much drug money. I mean, if you look at what happened in MENA, and there are two retired Army CID investigators. Which, uh, Gene Wheaton is very public, and I know Gene well. Um, who Mr. estimate Robert. the amount of drug money flowing through MENA at $40 million a month and through the Arkansas Development Financial Authority, which is what made Bill Clinton a hero in the state of Arkansas. So, yeah, it's probably there. Mr. Rupert, I want to congratulate you on your courage, sir. And I want to ask you if you had any assistance from uh, former officer Rothmiller, who wrote the book, L.A. Secret Intelligence Police. I, I, I just said a few minutes ago, I, I know Mike. We have spoken many times over the years. Yes, uh, we share a lot of views. His book's a good book. Uh, he, he and I actually work patrol in Wilshire Division at, at the same time, so, yeah. Hi there. Um, I don't know if that one of the elbows with Tom Hayden, but I'll take it on your word that it's a good thing, the, uh, the March. For, I have one question. Do you know what happened to former CIA Director Colby? He supposedly died mysteriously. Uh, well, you know, my, my, drowned. Yeah, right. my attorney called me up uh, the day they found his body and wanted to make sure I had an alibi. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I don't know personally. I've just received a, an updated copy of the Franklin cover-up, which contains some very disturbing questions about Bill Colby's death. Um, but I don't have any direct knowledge, but uh, who knows? I have two questions. Your bravery is astounding the past 20, 25 years of your investigation. Is your life still in danger today, and is there any contracts out on your life? And secondly, what is the, um, the whole purpose of, of the rally, and how are we going to bring all these people to justice um, okay. in the end? First of all, uh, no, I, I wouldn't know if there was a contract out on me. I haven't been shot at for a long time. I'm fairly well-known now, and they tend not to kill people who are fairly well-known. The problem is you can get so well-known, it doesn't make any difference to yeah, with Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm nowhere near that big yet, so I think I'm safe for a while. Um, as to what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it, I am relieved of having to answer that question. Again, what I have come to from a spiritual and a constitutional and an American standpoint is that my job is to do the right thing and to leave the results to a power greater than myself. The only sin that I'm aware of is not standing up. That's the sin that I'm aware of. Yes, sir. I think it rather paradoxical that uh, there's enough evidence against the uh, Mr. Clinton and his administration to put most of them in prison. My question is, how intrusive 
has drugs become part of the operation in Washington, D.C., amongst the congressmen, the senators? And why is it that we don't have one person who, who will stand up and initiate impeachment proceedings on this uh, scum that we have in the office? Now, uh, does drugs have an effect here, and uh, why, why is it we're not getting anything done? Uh, all investigation and no prosecution. Drugs have an effect everywhere. In the Cotolo Watchtower affidavits, there's the story of one congressman named Larkin Smith who tried to stand up, who was looking into the Tyree murder case. He was flying on an investigation when his plane crashed and he was killed. Hale Boggs, they kill congressmen, they can kill presidents. Um, Maxine Waters walks a fine line. She is a Democrat, a member of the minority party. She doesn't chair any committees. She is chairwoman of the Black Caucus, yes. But she alone, as a member of Congress, doesn't have the power to stand up. I am going to make it very clear in my speech Saturday that where the people lead, Congress will follow. We have got the cart before the horse. We can't expect anybody to do for us what we will not demand that they do by ourselves. Okay? We have to stand up together. Congress ain't going to listen until we do. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Mr. Rupert. Um, it is very clear to me that you are a very holy man, and you are totally surrounded and protected by the love of God wherever you go. And I particularly like the way you said, do you ever get a feeling that God is following you with this stuff? I love it. Thank you very much. I do have a question. Um, it's very clear to me that it's AAA, all about addiction. There is no easier way, is there, to control people than to get them addicted. Now, whether it's called legal drugs or illegal drugs, a drug is a drug is a drug. I would like to know if you know how far and to what involvement the American Medical Association is involved in this. Thank you. I sometimes feel like I would have to be God to answer some of these questions. Um, <laughs> let me put it this way. We have all heard stories about a dysfunctional family where a father is molesting a young daughter. And there are other children in the family and there's a wife. And we look at these tragedies and we see how the wife ignores what's going on. And the other children ignores what, ignore what's going on. For the sake of maintaining the family image, for the sake of looking good, for the, out of the fear that if they expose what's going on, the father will turn his rage against them. And that's a dysfunctional family. This country is in that state of denial. Every aspect of this country is affected by this crisis. Let me define it to you this way. And I'll be real brief with this. Could the President of the United States, the executive branch, which theoretically is empowered over the CIA, have permitted the agency to deal drugs to American citizens? Or could it have happened without him knowing about it? Either way, you have just defined the greatest crisis, constitutional crisis, in American history since the Civil War. And solving it is going to take that kind of upheaval. Leadership in this will have to show that we can do this nonviolently in a healthy way in the American spirit, not in the German spirit, not in the Russian spirit, not in the Chinese spirit, but in the American spirit. Yes, I appreciate that remark. I uh, would like to have us all remember that what I believe you have described this evening is not a man-made battle. But we are wrestling against principalities and powers in high places. And basically, that is a spiritual problem. And we're not going to go out here as a group of people and conquer this in our own strength. It'll be like David putting on Saul's armor. It doesn't fit. It only weighs us down. But I believe it's in First Chronicles where it tells us, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and turn from their wicked ways, then will we hear from heaven, and I will heal their land. 
And that's what we've got to come back to. We're kidding ourselves here, sitting here thinking, now I appreciate the rally, and I, I support it wholeheartedly. But as a group, we're kidding ourselves if we think we're going to go out and do this in our own strength. Only history will be repeated again and again. But it says we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and let him operate through our lives and then put our hand to the plow. We will conquer. And, and, and my fervent hope in response to that, where two or more are gathered in his name, he is also there. What if 10 or 15,000 are gathered and many of those gather in his name, too? Yes. Yeah, I very much appreciate that comment. Uh, I did want to, you mentioned earlier about Mina and Nella, which we've all been most familiar with. Ten, as uh, far as my understanding goes, ten investigations have been, have begun, and I guess the tenth one is in some way going on now. But what, uh, where, where, what has caused these all to to end and the, and the information, the myriad of tons of information that have been gathered to uh, to not result in any uh, any meaningful action. The way this country works is that unless it shows up in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Time or Newsweek, officially it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And there can be investigations until the cows come home. And, you know, the information is out there. We have it. I have it. Everybody else have it. The dozens of other witnesses have it. Gene Wheaton has it. Terry Reed has it. I've spoken to Terry several times. Okay. The point is, is that we have to make something happen in the collective consciousness to get it out to where somebody admits it openly. Mike, just one moment on that. Uh, you know that we, we know two boys, you know, two young teenage innocent boys were killed. And we know a number of other people relating to that same, those deaths were also killed. And we do know that enough information is, is extant to make a case. It seems to me that a rifle shot has to be fired in order to break through this wall instead of these little hammers banging away. Some focal point has to be singled out and just hammer it through till it breaks the dam. You raise, you raise a beautiful point. I'm, Mike wants to say something in a second, but let me talk to that point for a second. I have met all over the years, I have met people who were angry with the IRS, and I have met people who were angry over many, many different righteous, justified causes. But they have been a Tower of Babel. As I view this from a political standpoint alone, I see the single issue of CIA and drugs as being the one single issue which can crack the armor. And when will the armor crack? The armor will crack when a farmer in Iowa and somebody in St. Louis and Wisconsin and Colorado who's middle America, who's, you know, wakes up and catches on to this, that's when the armor will crack. And as far as I'm concerned, and I have many opinions about many other issues, publicly I speak only about CIA and drugs, because that's the one where I think we got a chance to win. Mike wants to say something. Yeah, I, I want to briefly say uh, exactly that. Uh, you know, the, the people have talked here about the Republican and the Democratic parties, and one of the things they always talk about is wedge issues. And they always want to try to drive a wedge. They want to drive a wedge between blacks and whites. They want to drive a wedge between Latinos and whites, between blacks and Latinos. They're constantly looking for issues on the theory of divide and conquer. And when they mean conquer, that's what they want to do. They're not just talking in, you know, figurative terms. And we're looking for some cement. We're looking for things that are going to wedge us together. In a, in, a, in a way. And we're looking at this in the say, as they say, crack the CIA. We want to find something that is going to affect the conscience and the consciousness of, of many, many people to see our commonality and our common struggle. And it, I wanted to respond to what we want to destroy not only the cocaine cartel, but we're saying this is much bigger than the problem of cocaine. This is a this is a systematic. In other words, before there was cocaine, there was heroin. Before there was heroin, there was opium. Before there was opium, they were selling liquor to the Indians. Before there was, you know, they, 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 they traded slaves for tobacco. 
and, and uh, addicted people. Uh, this, this is going back a, a half a millennium and longer. I just want to say that one of the things about this coalition that I think will distinguish it is that we are not actually trying to get the government to do anything about this because we understand that they are the problem. We are trying to affect ourselves. We're hooked into the recovery movement. It's not only, you know, here's one person who says I'm an addict, an alcoholic, whatever, but there are many, many people in the black community, groups called Mad Dads, many, many people who are saying we have to take the responsibility to transform ourselves, and by doing that, we will transform this government and society. We're not expecting them to solve this problem for us. Michael. I'd like to thank you first for coming this evening, standing up, saying what you said. I respect you. I appreciate your being here this evening and what you said. Thank I have you. a brief observation myself, and I'd like to get your response to it. And the observation is that Thomas Jefferson said that we need a revolution every 20 years. The last time the people of this country stood up and told the government enough is enough was 25 years ago when we told them we'd had enough of Vietnam. And I think it's time for our, the people in this country to stand up and say enough is enough and we've had it. And if that's a revolution and we can do it peaceably in the streets like we did 25 years ago, but peaceably, then I'm 100 percent behind it. And I think it's something, an idea whose time has come and there's nothing that's going to stop it. And I'm very glad that you're doing what you're doing, because we need it. Now, Thank you. Your response, anybody else? All I can say to that is ditto. Yeah, I, I just want to make a comment that I think that rally will be real important to this uh, you know, neighborhood in showing and bringing it out to light to the average public how you aren't just hurting yourself when you use drugs, but you're hurting your country. And uh, it's OK if people want to hurt themselves. But when you realize and then people that are out there using realize that it's actually hurting their country and their country's behind it. And you're sponsoring uh, something that's going to break your livelihood apart and your other people. I think it's going to be uh, bring a lot of light to the, uh, the neighborhood. So thanks. I think you're right. OK. Yes. Unless you demand that the government destroy the cocaine cartel and organized crime, who have done all this damage to the American people, you're not going to get the American people behind you. You're not going to get American justice. My question is, why aren't you, why don't you have a plan to destroy the cocaine cartel, and why don't you want to make the government do that? This is the We have to fix the government first. We can't get a government that doesn't respond to us to do anything in our interest until we fix the government. If you're going to be there tomorrow morning, why don't you make that demand in front of the press and for the press to press that why isn't the government destroying the cocaine cartel? The cartel. It's, it's nice to have a spirited group. And on the behalf of the forum, we want to thank Mike Rupert for an interesting talk. Please bear with us. Looking forward to having you come back. I do hope you do. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.